We had a minor microphone issue this week. We're working on it for next time. Please accept our apologies and a partial refund. Here's the podcast. Previously on the British Broadcasting Century. September 1922. Britain's ears don't know what's about to hit them. Well, apart from those that do know what's about to hit them, because they've already been hit by a wall of sound. Manchester music, London lectures, and Essex... I say, is he really saying that? The BBC is said to be born. But wait, there's no staff, no start date, and not every home has a radio yet. This is going to be the toughest broadcasting company launch since... Well, there haven't really been many. So this time, the British Wireless Exhibition convinces a nation. Or most of them. Or some of them. Well, one bloke walks past a stand and goes, what does this button do? Plus, the first outside broadcast, the first Royal British broadcast, and also this episode, it's officially formed in a small room on the second floor of a building on the Strand, the British Broadcasting Company. Here, on the very much unrelated, good to stress that every single week, the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. Hello, hello, thank you for being here. It's episode 14. They all said it would never last. Well, they didn't, but you could tell they meant it. This is the podcast about the birth of broadcasting in Britain, as never told before, at least not in audio form, as far as I'm aware, which is odd. You would have thought, it being radio, that audio is an appropriate way to tell this story. Well, all it's taken is a global pandemic and the cancellation of all my other work to find time and opportunity to devour every book on the subject I can find and then churn them out into 20 to 30 minute episodes just for you. So in episodes yet to come, we've got the first radio dramas, the first radio comedies, and very soon, a chap called John Reith. You may have heard of him. But the last few episodes, we've had a fairly sort of split-level story about the big bosses deciding how this BBC will function and the broadcasters who are still testing out this wonderful place where technology and art sort of meet here on the wireless. So this time, the listeners... But more exciting than that, the listeners who don't yet know that they're going to be listeners. Yes, for this BBC experiment to work, Britain's ears need to be angled towards the wireless, which means that homes need radio sets. But first up, uh, news time from us. Wayne Clark has been in touch. Hello, Wayne. He's been inspired by something that we said early on on the podcast uh, to theme part of his Sunday service that was broadcast across BBC stations on BBC Sounds. You know, under this pandemic conditions, church is moving online and indeed the BBC are doing their bit as well. We were talking about broadcasting the word, how it used to mean farmers scattering seed before media broadcasters adopted the term. So Wayne based his talk on that. So cheers to Wayne. Delighted that that has made it onto the real live actual BBC. Another place that we've been heard is a bit unexpected. I get an email every week or so from a website called Chartable. It tells me how the podcast is sort of doing. Turns out we're big in Estonia. Well, I say big. Bigger there than we are elsewhere. I've no idea why. If you are listening in Estonia, hello to you. Maybe there's one person in Estonia telling lots of other people about it, or indeed downloading the podcast on all of their friends' devices. That's a good thing you can do in the UK, the US, wherever you are. We'd love to be bigger on all of those charts as well. So do tell your friends about us, steal their phones, and subscribe to us. Also, if you're super quick, I'm doing a writing course. I'm hosting it. I normally do this in real person, in real life. And now we're all sort of moving online. I'm doing it for the first time as an online writing course. It will be on Zoom. We start very soon, September 23rd. So you probably missed it, in fact. But I will be doing it again in January in 2021. You can join my mailing list and information will appear about that. Again, the link is in the show notes. Finally, before we stampede into the British Wireless Exhibition, This from Andrew Barker. He was our guest last week, and he's got some feedback for us on one of our little quirks here on the podcast. Our old-fashioned radio voice. I've got one slight objection to the way some of the clippings have been read out, some of the quotes. Oh, yes. On those old microphones that have been probably almost shouting. They'll be saying, hello, 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 CQ. They were telephone receivers, Mm. and very poor quality. I I think they almost shouted some of those things in the very early days before they got the... uh, the, the better microphones. That's a good point. Maybe I should start shouting some clips instead. Maybe two words. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah. well, Just, not shouting, but in a commanding voice. I think. Yes, fair enough, fair enough. Well, thank you, Andrew Barker. I will see if I can be 
more commanding. I mean, I will see if I can encourage our old-fashioned radio voice, who's certainly not me, to be more commanding. What do you say, old-fashioned radio voice? Hello, hello. I hear your command to be more commanding, and I commend you on your command to be more commanding. I will commence being more commanding. Thank you, old-fashioned radio voice. We'll see if that sticks. Right then, to business. Coming up, some AM and some FM. That's an airwave memory from Philip Rowe of the History of European Theatre podcast. And FM is our first-hand memories from you. You can email me, paul at paulcarenza.com, with some of those. But first, let's sell a few radio sets. So welcome to September 1922. You might recall we've got three functioning radio stations in Britain at this point. Essex, London and Manchester. Now last week we were largely in Manchester, this week we're largely in London and as for Essex we will return there in a couple of episodes time but just know that at this point Captain Peter Eckersley he is still on air most Tuesdays, he's overrunning, playing the fool, generally going against the grain. But going for the grain of course is Arthur Burroughs of 2LO in London. He's innovating all of the time. They had commentary on the first King's Cup race that the Daily Mail was sponsoring and following at the time. That's for planes flying from Croydon Aerodrome in London to Glasgow and back in a record six hours and 32 minutes. There is no surviving audio of the King's Cup air race of 1922, but you can see silent film footage. We'll put a link to the film in the show notes. Biplanes are plenty. So that's early September, and Arthur Burroughs generally is showing off radio, touring around London to clubs and societies, convincing them almost door to door and house to house how good radio is. Arthur Burroughs is very much involved then in the events put on by the Wireless Society of London to help promote this new medium and art form, including at the very start of September at Central Hall in Westminster, there's the first international radio exhibition, and then from September 30th at the Horticultural Hall down the road in Westminster, the first First all British wireless exhibition and convention, or Fab Week for short. Nobody actually called it that. Oh, look, a radio set. Yes, doesn't it look nice? I wonder what it does. This first all British wireless exhibition and convention, you see, it's quicker to say Fab Week. It runs for the first Fab Week of October 1922. There are radio sets, concerts, demonstrations, loudspeakers playing the live show from Marconi House in the Strand to the Horticultural Hall of Westminster, just a mile or two away. This is new for so many people, and it is huge. 25,000 people turn up at this event. There are concerts daily at the convention at 11am, 3, 6 and 8pm. And here's DJ Siri, the ghost of broadcasting future, to tell us who was on. Welcome to the first All-British Wireless Exhibition and Convention. Opening on Saturday the 30th of September, it's Mr. Rodney Bennett with In Summertime on Breeden. Following him, an entertainer, Mr. Charles Corey. At 6pm, it's this, tenor Walter Glenn, singing Passing By. Then down in the forest, there are violin performances from Miss Kathleen Lart and contralto Miss Phyllis Evanette. On the 2nd of October, the exhibition is opened at 11am by soprano, Miss Dorothea St. Hilborn. There are humorists like William Parkin and Herbert Dixon. Morris Cole would go on to become the BBC's first pianist, but here he plays Rachmaninoff and Chopin. John Buckley sings sea shanties, like Falmouth is a fine town. Which, of course, it is. There are also new versions of old songs we've heard in broadcasting's early days. Caprice Viennois. Played a sea by Arthur Burroughs in 1920. The Blind Plowman. Has sung a 2MT riddle by Melchior. And Home Sweet Home. Has sung by Nellie Melba in the first ever British broadcast. It's a greatest hits of the story so far. Or... Arthur Burroughs, who has chosen all of these, has a pretty short playlist. So these are the songs that tens of thousands hear while strolling the aisles and perusing radio sets. 2LO is still a demonstration station, so this is right up their street. And it does give Marconi's an excuse to ask artists to work for that horrid word, free. Or indeed, to publicise their theatre shows. 
The phrase transition period is used frequently in request letters that are sent out. You know, help us with our experimentation until we find our feet. And looking at the budgets today, the broadcasters are still finding their feet, at least when it comes to paying me. Stars like Will Hay, Sybil Thorndike, and many more could double up thanks to 2LO's prime West End location. They do a radio show, then race to the theatre, or vice versa. You know, like the cast of Wicked appearing on Children in Need. One downside that Arthur Burroughs regrets is that because he's mostly not paying people, or paying very little, he can't dictate what they actually sing at this point. He's hungry for real money, because then, of course, you can boss people about. You can ensure that the songs they sing are the ones that the listeners actually want, or indeed deserve, as he often thought. For now, until 1923, though, each singer sings whatever they like, and Burroughs puts his head in his hands at their song choice, watching the artists trip over the headphone cables, dropping microphones and muttering, Was that OK? as soon as they thought they were off air. All of this happened far too often. Thankfully, though, not too noticeable at this exhibition. The entire event is a huge hit. Now, during this exhibition week, Burroughs crams in 27 half-hour concerts and 50 artists. Again, thanks to that central London location, which also grants us the big finale. On the last day of the exhibition, a landmark moment for British broadcasting. It's the first Royal Address. October 7th, 1922, at 7.30pm, the Prince of Wales delivers a message from his palace for a mass gathering of Boy Scouts. But thanks to radio, he can reach the Scouts who can't make it because they, I don't know, decided not to be prepared. His Royal Highness is live via radio from St James's Palace, just after being live in person at a Scout rally at Alexandra Palace. And his voice there is communicated via the also new and rather fancy public address system. In any other year, that would get all the attention, but of course, this is the year of the BBC. Ali Pali, of course, is seen years later for the first TV broadcasts. We'll get to that in about 20 seasons' time on the podcast. But yes, this is the first outside broadcast, thanks to four miles of landline from Marconi House to St James's Palace. Good job the Prince wasn't at Balmoral. This Prince of Wales would go on to become King Edward VIII, the one who abdicated for the love of Wallace Simpson. But his first love was radio. Maybe. And that makes the Prince of Wales the first member of the royal family to make a public broadcast. Arthur Burroughs is there, personally coaching and directing the Prince's speech. There are, unfortunately, no recordings, apart from this one that I've just found at the back of my larynx. Boy Scouts, wherever you may be, I have been received today at the Alexandra Palace by some 40,000 scouts and 17,000 wolf cubs. If the rest of you are like those I have seen, your standard of smartness and efficiency is a high one. But apart from outward signs, I admire more especially the inward spirit of goodwill and patriotism, which makes the whole movement so like a brotherhood. You are all doing splendid work by doing your best to be prepared by making good citizens for your empire. You could do nothing better. Stick to it. I wish you every possible success and good camping. Yes, Britain's first royal broadcast ends with the words, good camping. Now, as you will tell from my recreation, the Prince is noted at the time for his excellent speaking voice. In fact, when Arthur Burroughs rehearses with him, he thinks him to have a broadcasting voice of really exceptional quality. Hundreds, maybe thousands of scouts tune in. There were over 200 reports, including Cardiff, where 250 scouts have gathered to listen in. Others crammed dozens into dining rooms of homes to hear the wireless. But you may recall from earlier episodes that most radios at the time, the cat's whisker ones, they require headphones to work. So where several listen at once to this broader casting, it would be on pricier valve sets, better quality. These valve sets, though, need charging, unlike the cat's whisker ones that rely on, I don't know, the wind and magic, pretty much. But you can't just plug a valve set into your home. Electrical circuits aren't of a uniform standard at this point. No, instead, you would go to your local bicycle workshop to charge your radio. Isn't it obvious? To our modern brains, of course not. But at the time, they thought that bikes and radios, both a bit engineery, and localised enough, so next time you listen to your smart speaker or DAB radio, imagine popping down to Evan Cycles every few days to give it enough juice to listen in. Weird, I know. 
Cat's Whisker crystal sets, funkier valve sets, all of these would be on display at the wireless exhibition, educating the public about this new thing called radio. Another singer you would hear at the exhibition is Rex Palmer. Now he'll ultimately take over running 2LO, the London station, after Arthur Burroughs hands it over to Stanton Jeffries to focus on programming. And then when Stanton Jeffries wants to focus on musical direction, he hands it over to this guy, Rex Palmer. Rex Palmer actually will go on to become the sixth staff member of the BBC, and he'll be the first to be hired directly by the general manager, the big boss, John Reith himself. Like all of the early staff there, Rex is a man of many pseudonyms and job titles. So he'll be Uncle Rex on the Children's Hour, Rex Faithful as a singer, Rex Palmer as a producer, and he'll be hugely well known in all of these capacities. I would say Rex Palmer is the David Walliams of his day child friendly when he wants to be grown up entertainment after hours and after after hours well best not ask put it this way on desert island discs in 1958 rex palmer was one of the only people to choose no book only alcohol but right now he's the voice that you hear walking around fab week the first all british wireless exhibition and convention now, while the exhibition's been going on, the British Broadcasting Committee have been meeting. Sir William Noble writes on October the 5th, All differences have been settled and we shall be ready to register the company at an early date. Well, not that early, of course. Listeners have been waiting for months. And a week later, a notice is sent out to 400 wireless manufacturers saying, basically, come on in, the broadcasting's lovely. Finally, there are advertisements in newspapers for the first staff. They want a general manager, a director of programmes, a chief engineer and a secretary. Yeah, just four roles. That will fill the BBC. Now, if you've been listening into this podcast, you will know the names of three of the four people who fill those roles. If that is, you've been paying attention. I'll tell you who they are very shortly. Applications, though, in the meanwhile, to Sir William Noble, chairman of the British Broadcasting Committee. On October the 18th, 1922, the BBC is formed. Over 400 are invited, but present are over 200 representatives from wireless firms. That's more than expected to show up. They gather in one room. It's a small antechamber on the second floor of the Institute of Electrical Engineers. And these wireless manufacturers are told that you can join this BBC that we have created. We just ask for a £50 deposit and for you to buy a £1 share. It's agreed to be financed by a licence fee of 10 shillings. There'll be no foreign sets for two years and all new legal sets will be stamped BBC type approved by the Postmaster General. The small committee of wireless manufacturers, you know, Marconi's and so on, they're officially renamed the Broadcasting Committee at this point. It shows that their negotiations have ceased and they're now here to prepare the way for the BBC. They will oversee everything for the early days. They're basically midwives for the birth of the BBC. At the meeting, Lord Gainford becomes that neutral chairman of the board for 500 quid a year. That's about 30 grand in today's money. There are eight directors on 200 pounds a year, basically the big bods of the big six, like Godfrey Isaacs of Marconi's, uh, McKinstry of Metrovic, his old rival, William Noble, who's been overseeing most of it, John Gray of British Thompson Houston, who's also actually the chairman of Hot Point. And later on, two independent directors come along who are elected by smaller firms, including Sir William Bull, director of Siemens. So it just makes me wonder, Hot Point, Siemens, it's all the white goods companies. Before dishwashers were even invented, their company bosses were the first directors of the BBC. So in case you want to know, Hot Point at this point make irons, ovens and toasters. Siemens make uh, telegraph lines and light bulbs. In fact, they power the world's first electric street lighting in Godalming, which bizarrely is about three miles from where I am now in Surrey. It makes you think that while those broadcasters, you know, Eckersley, Burroughs, uh, Wright in Manchester, A. E. Thompson in Birmingham, these are the people doing radio. But the bosses who are coming in as that first board of directors, none of them have really known radio at all. You know, at least Ditcham and Round, those early engineers in the very start of this podcast, Mr. Ditcham would broadcast as well as being a genius engineer. But this new board, well, they're electrical management with cash. And these bosses of Hot Point and Siemens, they will be plumbing in our homes in the future. Radio is just another home appliance that they need to try and get into our 
houses. But the day after the BBC forms, that's October the 19th, 1922, a huge thing happens. And it's massive. It changes everything. And I will tell you what it is in just a few minutes' time. We'll pick up the story in a moment, but it's time for some other voices on the podcast. Let's have AM, your airwave memories. This time that comes from Philip Rowe. Philip runs the History of European Theatre podcast. So if you enjoy this one, I think you might like Philip's. It's all about how well, men and then later on women decided to present and perform stories to and for other people, going way back from the Temple of Dionysus in Athens onwards. And Philip's airwave memories are, I think, appropriate to this episode on the exhibition. Because sometimes we think of the programmes that were coming out of the radio sets, but Philip was fascinated with the radio set itself. My earliest memory of radio really comes from the early 1970s. As a family, we always used to have breakfast together because my father worked late into the evenings in advertising and we often didn't see him as children before we went to bed. So my mother always insisted we had breakfast together in the morning and part of that ritual was to have the radio on in the background. And it was usually Radio 2 with, I think, Terry Wogan by that time already doing his early morning show. But it was the the radio itself that really stands out because it was a very old model, a real radiogram set. I think it had been inherited from my grandparents uh, when they got something more modern. So it was probably a late 1950s, maybe early 1960s model. A great big square box, very dark, brown, covered with a, a sort of a cloth where you could see the speakers underneath great big white now going yellow maybe you could call them ivory if you were being kind but bake like knobs to control the volume and the tuning and it really was that tuning that was most fascinating to me as a child i used to when no one was around get out a tall kitchen stool climb up on it and try and read off the names of the places on the tuning dial the exotic ones um moscow prague Paris, Berlin, Sofia, and even the less exotic ones, Northern Ireland, Western Highlands, they always had this air of mystery and excitement about them that really got me excited and I think promoted sort of a general inquisitiveness about the world. Thank you, Philip. His History of European Theatre podcast covers the big characters like Oedipus, you know, the one who married his mother and killed his father. Uh, Agamemnon, he's the one who sacrificed his daughter to get a good sailing to Troy. Uh, Socrates, a fool full of useless thoughts, according to Aristophanes, his so-called friend. So if you are intrigued by these people and the idea that the modern sitcom, in fact, could be traced back to ancient Greek comedy, then check out the History of European Theatre podcast and tell them we sent you. In later years, we moved down to transistor radios. Great little things. Very tiny, tiny dial on it. No excitement about the tuning now. Uh, it was just numbers. But you could listen to that in bed very quietly. And that's what I did quite often because I loved to just t- turn that dial and see what I could hear. And it was in the early days of Capital Radio. I always remember Alan Freeman was doing a series called The History of the Album and uh, it was on quite late at night. So I always had to sneak the transistor it radio into my bed and try and stay awake long enough to listen to this. The climax was a countdown of what they thought were the top 10 albums of all time. And uh, of course, Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was number one. But I was fascinated to hear what their other choices would be. But it was the day before we were going on holiday. And I really had to be careful that my parents didn't know that I was trying to keep myself awake. But it was worth it for that pleasure of hearing Alan Freeman counting down those albums. I think I made it to the end, although I've heard Sergeant Pepper so many times since then, I can't really be sure. Before we get back to that very big thing that happened the day after the BBC formed, I will tell you about that shortly. Let's right now have your FM, your first-hand memories. They can be emailed to us, paul at paulcarenza.com. Penny Culliford has been in touch to describe seeing radio firsthand. She says, watching the clock and making sure everything is perfectly timed. That was marvellous. The weirdest thing is having a window onto a shopping centre, in this case of the studio. Try not to be distracted by the bloke stacking oranges in Sainsbury's. You do get studios in odd locations. I'm sensing BBC Local. They do crop up in shopping centres now and then. 
Vicky Salmi says, making Alistair McGowan corpse while impersonating Hugh Edwards for Dead Ringers. Don't know if she was impersonating or making him corpse, or who knows. And Tim Hill says he was prepping for the Sunday morning breakfast show one Thursday morning. And the presenters wanted my take, he says, on what had happened the previous day. A football cup draw. So the morning presenter called up Yuri Geller, of all people, for some advice on positive thinking. The aim was to harness the positive energy of all listeners. I can see that working as a feature. But as soon as the phone line with Yuri on was switched to live on air, the entire system blew. It's a bit like, do you remember Melchior a few episodes ago with Peter Eckersley? Yeah, similar thing. The entire thing went. Signal lost. The link to the draw being covered by Radio 4 was lost as well. Alarm lights started flashing. Screens went off. And the backup generator came on. The mic was live again. You can see where this is going. The bewildered presenter explained all of this to the listeners and then said, Yuri, are you still there? Do you know what just happened? And of course, Yuri Geller replied, it was a power surge. It had happened to other radio stations when he did interviews. He just couldn't control it. And hey, here's another thing we can't control. The march of time and history and the way things just happen. Back in 1922, one day after the BBC was formed on October the 18th, that very big thing happened. What was it? The government collapsed. It had been in a coalition for years, but a coalition might work in wartime, but those differences show up in peacetime. So October the 19th, a meeting of Conservative MPs decisively votes that that's it. David Lloyd George's coalition is over. So what does that government collapse mean for this just formed but not started officially broadcasting yet BBC? Well, it means A, they will rush to broadcast this new election. Let's see if we can get the BBC going in time. And B, well, depending on who gets in, this BBC will have a future or it won't. Time will tell how this governing party affects the BBC. And we're still not entirely sure yet. And hey, before we go, here's a quirk of fate. The Conservatives at this point have a small group of MPs, the London Unionists, and their secretary is a young man who also joins Sir William Bull, MP for Hammersmith as his campaign manager, re-election and all of that. So this political secretary, who finds himself rather busy in the two weeks to election, he is John Reith. Yeah, he's got no aspirations at this point to be in broadcasting. While the BBC is coming into being in this election frenzy, Reith is just trying to help his boss get re-elected. So it's about time we met the man who puts the wreath into wreathian principles, wreath. Next time, we will see how John Wreath jumped from job to job, from the time of Ditchman Round's first railway timetable recitals to the BBC's launch. You see, handily, John Wreath kept a pretty rock-solid diary for decades, and he actually burnt a lot of it because he had, well, something to hide, it would seem. I think you'll be surprised. Skeletons in the cupboard, potentially. Oh, and indeed, he does use a cupboard as an office in the early days. So that's a little unusual. Then again, I speak to you right now from my wardrobe studio. So haven't moved that far along, have we? So next episode, we will find out what John Reith was up to during all of this radio pioneering, because one thing's for sure, he wasn't broadcasting. In fact, he starts his job as boss of the BBC, having barely heard of it. That's next time. Hope you have a fab week. That's the first all-British wireless exhibition and convention, of course. But also have a fabulous seven days, or however long it is, until the next episode of the British Broadcasting Century. Presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. If you've enjoyed the show as much as, say, a cup of coffee, why not tip us the price of a cup of coffee at coffee.com, that's ko-fi.com, slash Paul Carenza. Or for perks and benefits and things, you could join us on patreon.com, slash Paul Carenza. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at BB Century, and they're free. Original music was by Will Farmer. Archive clips are public domain as far as we know. If you think differently, ask us to read your clip and we will oblige. Stay informed, educated and entertained and join us next time for Wreath on the British Broadcasting Century.